uh, good morning. It is Friday, September 11th. Uh, this is a joint meeting with Senate Health and Welfare and House uh, Health Care. And so we're joined today by Chairman Bill Lippert and his committee. And so, and all members of our, our committee, some will be here a little bit late. So thank you all for being here. The, we're gonna be doing this again next week where we're talking about another issue. And I think it's really helpful to have both committees together. Um, so the first item, uh, the, the agenda item that we're working on is from the Department of Financial Regulation. And uh, I think, Bill, why don't we just allow Jill to go ahead with her presentation uh, so we can understand the issue. Great. Yes. Good morning. Um, and uh, Senator Lyons, it's, I think it's uh, good when we're able to be as efficient as possible, given everything that's on our plates right now. So I appreciate being able to do this jointly and look forward to uh, uh, doing a joint session again next week. Um, I think the materials have all been sent out, although I understand there were some revisions uh, at the last in the last day or so. So, uh, Jill, when you present, um, it would be good for us both to understand the language as well as the rationale and, and may perhaps help us understand what, what changes were made. So yeah. I agree. Let's Thank proceed. You. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Joe, go ahead. And I, are you going to put the uh, language up? Um, I don't have the ability to share my screen, but Nelly or Demis, do, um, you, you are co Oh, I am. You have been, yeah. I could try. <laughs> I have never done this. If it, it's just the one page of the um, of the language, it might be easier if if Nelly, Nelly if you have it to throw it up on the screen. Nelly or Demis, can you put up the that's got red and blue in the middle paragraph number one? It's the second one. Uh, yep. Give me one second. I can. Uh, I'll pull it up. Sure. It's uh, the second on the under Jill's name. While she's doing that, I can start. Thank you, thank you, Chair Lyons and Chair Lippert for having me and committee members. Um, my name is Jill Rickard and I'm the Director of Policy for the Department of Financial Regulation. Let me just make sure, yep, that's the revised one. Um, and we appreciate the opportunity to present our uh, proposal to I don't want to say expand, but sort of clarify our emergency rulemaking authority uh, with respect to COVID-19 treatment, um, testing, and prevention. Um, we are proposing to expand the language in that is already in, um, it was in Act 91, and then it was revised slightly in Act number 140. And so we already have this, as you know, um, ability to adopt emergency rules um, we would propose just to make the changes that are set forth in item one here to expand, to direct health insurers to basically to waive, um, to uh, waive, or waive cost sharing requirements directly related to the diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, and this is the revised language that we're pro proposing. It, we had previously said related to the diagnosis of COVID-19 influenza, pneumonia, or other respiratory viruses. Um, we had some conversations with the insurers who were, you know, concerned that 85% of what providers see in the fall and the winter time obviously is respiratory illness related. And so they wanted to make sure that we were saying we're only requiring the waiver of cost sharing when it's related to COVID-19. And that was absolutely our intent. And so we just moved the language around to, to clarify that, um, we're requiring the waiver of cost sharing when it's related to the diagnosis of COVID-19, including tests for flu, pneumonia, and other respiratory viruses that are performed in connection with making a COVID-19 diagnosis. So basically, and I'll start with this one before I move on to treatment. Basically, we are aware <clears throat> that the symptoms of flu and pneumonia and certain other respiratory viruses are nearly identical to the symptoms of COVID-19. And so a provider <clears throat> in making a diagnosis of COVID-19 may or sort of most likely will order a flu test 
um, to rule out COVID-19, either before ordering a COVID-19 test or in connect or at the same time concurrently with ordering a COVID-19 test. And so we, we are trying to avoid the situation where an individual would go to their doctor, um, the doctor suspects COVID-19, the COVID-19 test is covered, but their office visit and or their flu test, they then have to pay for. So I, we, we believe and our intent in our original rules was that all would be covered at no cost share. And this is just a clarification of that. I will also note that the Federal CARES Act um, does require this to be covered at no cost share. Um, and they have issued guidance to specify that flu tests and other respiratory tests that are performed you know, in the workup to diagnosing COVID-19 should be covered at no cost share. So we really view this as just a clarification and not an expansion of our rulemaking authority. I'll stop there in case there are questions. Oh, you know what, I, sorry, I forgot to mention, we're, we're also aware that there is a new <clears throat> combined COVID-19 slash influenza test um, that will be introduced this fall. So this also is to make sure that that test is covered even though it's not just specifically COVID-19, it's, it's a combined test. So again, I'll stop there if there are any questions about the diagnosis piece. Questions, committee, committees. Yeah. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I don't know if I, oh yes, I can raise my hand. Okay, I'm just. Um, I won't see it. I mean, the, the, if you have a question, I think either uh, from either committee, please just speak up. I'll. We'll try and keep you in order, but I'm. I'll let me see if I can grab participants out of this. Yep, I, I can okay. see you. Right. Okay, so Jill, I'm. I, I do feel like I need a little bit more of an understanding of this. So, if does this mean that if I were to go to my physician or my medical provider, feel not feeling well, not sure, you know perhaps worried that I had COVID-19 but or the flu or, or whatever reason. If my provider made, uh, if my provider tested me for flu, they said, well, we need to, we need to do tests. So we're going to test you for flu. And if that comes back negative, we'll test you for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. but it comes back positive for flu. What, how does this apply then? If they have not so, yet tested for COVID-19? That's, a, does, that's this only, very... does, does this only cover this if in fact they test for COVID-19 first? So or that's that, a good... or, that it, or that it becomes a COVID-19 secondary diagnosis or first, I mean, does there have to actually be a diagnosis for COVID-19 for this to be covered? There does not. So this is, this is um, in, so it really, this comes down to provider education about coding. And so we would, yeah. we would expect to, <laughs> yeah, we, it, we have been talking about this and we've been talking about it with the insurers and internally. And I think when, if we, Problem if we adopt rules for this, which you know we we may be able to do this by bulletin, um, just to clarify what we mean here. But if we we do do the rules, or we do a bulletin, we would expect to include coding guidance in mm -hmm. the rule or the bulletin to educate providers and just make sure they're aware that if they suspect COVID nineteen, they need to use the COVID nineteen code, even if they're just doing a flu mm -hmm. test first but they do suspect COVID-19. If they code it, we're trying to figure out if you have COVID-19, that should be covered at no cost share. That, that and the flu test. That's if right. If they do a flu test. Right, if, if, they're, if they're attempting to diagnose COVID-19 and that is what's suspected and they code it that way, then doing a flu test first should be covered. And if it's, if the, if it's a suspicion of pneumonia or COVID-19, um, right, same thing. And the diagnosis for pneumonia often, as I understand, as I recall from some experience with family, uh, involves not necessarily a, a test, a swab or anything, but uh, sometimes an x-ray or uh, chest screen, you know, some, some kind of screening. Uh, is, that, is that what's covered here? Well, sometimes they do. 
an x-ray is a good question. And, and I, if you don't mind, I'll have to go back and talk to um, our attorney about that. I think we were thinking. I mean, how did they diagnose pneumonia? Well, sometimes they have breathing tests. <laughs> Do you know when you have to breathe into the tube? I don't know if you've had one of those, but um, oh, there I, are that I, sort I, of testing. I, I, but it, well, most often, I'm, what I'm familiar with is that most often it involves something beyond that to diagnose pneumonia. My understanding is if the provider were to put we, the COVID-19 code on the lab test or the x-ray um, uh, form <laughs> that's submitted mm -hmm. yeah. because they're suspected COVID, I, I'm not sure why they would do an x-ray first if they're actually suspecting COVID-19. I would think they would do a COVID-19 test first, but they might do it all simultaneously. That's if they the do it simultaneously, sure. If they put the code on there, that should be covered as well. My, my, my suspicion would be that if you come in and you're feeling that badly, mm -hmm. they're going to say, let's do all these tests. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. So I'm just trying to yeah. understand. That, that's a good question. And I can, I can get some clarification on that. But my understanding is this really all comes down to what the provider is, 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 expect, is diagnosing and what the quick coding they're using on their form. So if the suspicion is COVID-19 and they're attempting to diagnose COVID-19, then everything done in connection with that should be covered at no cost. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good question. Um, and it will be important to have clarification as we move forward with this. Uh, Representative Cordes, you have your hand up. Um, so a comment first about the previous, this conversation, um, it would be, important to make sure that um, all forms of imaging were covered in this bulletin, um, including ultrasound, because as we know, they're um, as part of um, the impact of COVID-19 includes clotting disorders um, and ultrasound is one method of imaging that is used to, um, to diagnose. Um, and unfortunately someone could have the flu and COVID and pneumonia, um, which sounds horrible. Um, so just that's my um, response to the, the previous conversation. Um, but I, my question is, do you, are you aware of how widespread the denial of claims has been um, for this issue? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Representative um, Cordes. We have not received any complaints of denials of these types of claims. And that's really because there is no flu uh, this summer. So when we promulgated the, our original emergency rule, it was late spring and we hadn't, we had, there was a lot of confusion about what should be covered, but we did not hear of people having to pay for a flu test while getting their COVID-19 test for free. And then summer came and there, there really just wasn't, there weren't very many instances of flu. Um, so we're, we're doing this as a sort of preemptive, we yeah. know flu is gonna come back in the fall and the winter. And we wanna make sure that this issue does not arise. So we, we are not aware of, of this happening at this point, but we, we want to make sure it doesn't. Okay, and one more, um, comment, the chest x-rays are definitely, uh, radiologists are able to gather a lot of information about what kind of respiratory illness it is, um, including um, COVID. Thank you. And I, you know, I, I think this questions like that and, and the details like that definitely will need to go into our rule um, I think this is sort of just giving us a little bit broad rulemaking authority to determine what's necessary based on what's happening in the market and, and speaking with all the stakeholders, including the providers to see what kind of tests are done and just making sure that we put the right coding guidance and um, details in the actual rule, if that makes sense. I mean, I, I yeah, I, I appreciate the, I appreciate that. I think we will definitely speak to providers to make sure we're putting the right wording in. So the uh, uh, representative Cordes is that that's good for you. 
you're, thank you. I saw that. <laughs> Uh, so uh, as I'm reading the language, I think it's extremely helpful because it says the diagnosis of, and then it says including test four, but including means not limited to. So it would, I would think that your bulletin and or rules uh, could include x-ray, x-radiology or other um, types of uh, diagnostic tools. Yes, exactly. And I think the including is to make sure that it's related to the diagnosis of COVID-19 and not, you know, if a provider su suspects pneumonia or some right. other form of respiratory illness, that is not necessarily covered if COVID-19 is not the suspected diagnosis. Exactly. Okay. Um, other questions from uh, House or Senate committee members? Huh. Well, if I may, I, I want to just jump in and say that I want to commend you, even though we haven't completed this, I, I want to commend you at the outset for being proactive and, and trying to anticipate this. I think that is, uh, I, when I, as I first learned of this proposed clarification, and I think it is a clarification, um, uh, I think you're to be commended for anticipating something which we know is coming, which is the flu season. And I think there's this the anxiety of the combination of flu and COVID and possible pneumonia as well is, is something which makes sense to be thinking ahead about. So. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate that greatly. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. I think you speak for all of us on that one. Uh, and also in anticipation of the dual uh, diagnostic test. So that's very helpful. Right. Uh, any other comments or questions well okay uh, at the risk of uh, why don't we take that yeah, uh, go ahead. i can i was just going to say uh representative smith has a question mm -hmm. so let's go there first and then move on representative smith brian are you there yeah can you hear me yes we can All right. thank you uh since we're on the subject of coding uh, I, I'm uh -oh. kind of curious, and <laughs> the reason that I'm going to ask this question is because it just happened uh, recently to a friend of mine. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, a, a serious brain cancer. He, he suffered with it for a couple of years, went into the hospital because it got so severe, and he died. Uh, coding said it was COVID-19 related. Now, if something goes into a coding department and they, they say that it's COVID related, does the hospital get extra COVID funding? Um, first of all, I'm sorry about your friend. Um, and second, I, I, I don't know. That's a little bit outside of the scope of my um, expertise, the, the CRF provider funding. That'd be, I think what, that would be more a question for um, Diva. Most yeah, I didn't know. I did not know if this was the right time to ask that question. But since you were on the subject of of coding, I thought I would ask. See if you did know. Yeah, I apologize. It's it's not oh, something don't. I'm familiar with. Right. Thank you. I'll, I'll yeah, the, ask uh, other people. Yeah, the coding question gets to be uh, complicated very quickly. Um, so uh, I don't know that we want to get into that discussion. I see that Representative Cordes wants to make a comment. So if you can make it short, that would be great. Coders don't choose, coders don't choose the code. Um, providers do. Providers do based on diagnostic evidence. Coders just make sure that we're in compliance with all the laws. Good. So there you have uh, Representative Smith, uh, another um, fun opportunity. I, I know that in the Senate, we have worked on the coding issue uh, in different committees at different times, and it does sometimes get frustrating, especially if you're dealing with a, a friend or an individual patient. Uh, any other questions for Jill? Senator um, Lyons, there is a like second part. Ask yeah, uh, go ahead. Oops, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. There is a second. Nope, that's second good. Part of it. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and just one more comment about the diagnosis. I mean, the <clears throat> the Federal Cares Act also covers this, and we would, you know, look to their guidance to make sure that we're covering the same types of tests and and clarifying that we're sort of covering the things, same things that the Federal um, Cares Act requires us to cover. So that's another part of this. Um, so the second part is with respect to treatment, and this is um, I'm not sure if you saw it, and I'd be happy to forward it. There is a New York Times article about a month ago um, that really that went not to the insured population, but it talked about the federal program for uninsured individuals to receive COVID-19 treatment without cost share, free COVID, or not, sorry, not without cost share because there's no insurance involved, but for free. And so it was happening um, on a number of occasions when somebody had a comorbidity, so they had COPD or diabetes or another um, serious illness already, and that illness was exacerbated by COVID-19. So they so they got COVID-19 and they had to be treated for COVID-19, but the provider had listed their comorbidity, their other serious illness, as the primary diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Then those were not those cases, and the treatment was not being covered for free under the program, simply because COVID-19 was not listed as the primary diagnosis, but rather a secondary diagnosis. So again, we have not heard of this happening in the insured population, um, but this is again, preemptive. We wanna make sure that if someone is hospitalized for COPD and really it's only flared up because COVID is happening or they have COVID, if COVID is listed as a diagnosis and not necessarily the primary diagnosis, that treatment would still be covered with zero cost share. And we really, that is purely a clarification. Well, I think, I think it's, again, I think it's, it's, it's uh, important to clarify this. Um, and in light of um, the health commissioner's recent emphatic statement when there was some question, not about payment, but about the reason that people were, um, in fact, dying, uh, the, the, the suggestion that because COVID was a secondary diagnosis in some such, in where, where many people have underlying conditions, mm -hmm. uh, the suggestion was that it really wasn't attributable to COVID. Uh, and I think that there's a, I mean, it's not, it's not the same issue, but it's a related issue that uh, if you have a comor comorbidity, as you say, uh, and COVID actually exacerbates the situation or makes it worse or causes, uh, in this case, uh, a very serious illness or possibly death, uh, the fact that COVID is not the primary diagnosis uh, does not mean that COVID is not uh, seriously involved in why you're ill or in some cases why you may have, uh, in fact, uh, died. So I, I, I find myself connecting the two as you're, as you're talking and again, uh, appreciating the clarification so that people are not caught in a conundrum here. I, I agree. Absolutely. That's a great point. So Ginny, may I, can, can we ask for the, for uh, Jill uh, to, can you clarify, th this is about emergency rulemaking authority, but under your emergency rulemaking authority, it also gives you, or what's the relationship between this and your issuing a possible bulletin versus going through rulemaking? Can you help us understand that relationship? Sure. We, it, so if we, our attorney had suggested that we make clear and explicit our authority to do this by rule. Um, the language, I guess it's arguable whether we already have the authority to do this under our current rules, but we wanted to make clear and explicit that we could amend or adopt new rules um, with respect to these two items. If we determine, if our attorneys determine that we already have this, or you know, our, our rule already covers this and we just need to clarify by bulletin, we can also do that. Um, we would appreciate though having the explicit authority and statute in case we determine that our current rule does not actually cover these things. Or if, someone, if someone were to challenge that. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, it looks as though the chair may have dropped off of the call. I'll uh, I'll okay. email her to see about getting her back yeah. on. Okay. In the meantime, I see that uh, Representative Durfee has a has his hand up. D David, do you have a question? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll just keep going. Keep us going until uh, okay. Senator Lyons can <laughs> I'll, rejoin I'll, us. I'll just keep. I'll fill the time until she's back with, with no. questions. That's that. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, thank you, Jill. I just want you alluded to the uh, to an article that had been in the news, and, and it, I think I've seen several about this uh, at the federal level uh, confusion over what the the intent was or what's actually happening. What, what we're looking at here does not deal with our uninsured population. Is that correct? This is no. this is this is meant to clarify how the those who are insured um, and, and regulated by, by Vermont uh, would be covered. That's right. Those who have um, commercial private insurance, not the self-insured population and not the uninsured population. Okay. Self-insured, we don't have any control over and the uninsured population, there is a program through the Department of Health through the, for those individuals. And that program, and which, I, which I know is not what we're talking about here, uh, does not have any of the we haven't. You, you mentioned that you're not aware of any cases in Vermont, but if there were issues in Vermont, um, how would those be addressed for for the uninsured? Well, there's two things. I mean, the the program for testing for uninsured individuals is through our Department of Health. That there is a federal program for also for. I guess also for testing and treatment of COVID. So if there were issues in Vermont um, with the federal program, that would be a little outside of our scope because we, we don't, it, it is a federal program and that is what the New York Times article was addressing. Um, I mean, it's a good question. I would hope those those things don't happen here and they're, and they're attempting to clarify that program to make sure that doesn't happen again, but that is not within the department's scope. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions from committee members for Jill at this point? Okay, I do not see any hands at this point. Um, so I think you have maybe clarified as much as what we need to know. Um, I, I, I wonder, so we don't really have, we, there's nothing. So when you issue this, or if you, if you issue a bulletin is our bulletins issued for prospective situations, or if a bulletin were issued and it turns out there had been a situation that had occurred, you know, some time prior, mm -hmm. does a bulletin reach back in time or is it only prospective? A bulletin. So a bulletin, oh, sorry, go ahead. Please. A, a bulletin would just clarify our existing law or regulation. So a bulletin would say, you know, this is what we meant by our rule. Um, and since our rule goes back to a date certain, which is March something, I, I apologize, I forget the exact date. It would actually just clarify the law back to that date and then cover all of those claims. Okay. Well, that's, that's, I think that's good to know that it, it, it would, it would, uh, if necessary, it would reach back to cover a situation. That's right. And we don't think there are, have been any instances of these things not being covered. Again, it's, it's for a prospective problem that we're anticipating and hoping doesn't happen. But if it does, we'd like the authority just to make sure that, right. To say our, our rule covers. Okay not seeing any other questions on this. There is a related issue that has been brought to my attention. And I don't know, Jill, uh, I, I maybe I'll raise it. And if, if it's really not for us to talk about today, but it seems like it might be the occasion to clarify if you do have information. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, not widespread, but at least in perhaps one instance or some, maybe instances we're not aware of, that a medical provider uh, has added an additional fee to cover COVID, quote, COVID expenses. Uh, 
and as a, a, a separate fee from the professional office visit or testing or whatever um, to cover the expenses of having to add PPE to the practice, et cetera. And I know that, I mean, I brought this to, to you know, I brought this up with Commissioner Pichak and he said that was, he was aware of the situation, but uh, we haven't had a chance to follow up. Is there, is there any clarification that you're able to offer as to whether that type of um, adding a separate COVID fee is an authorized way of proceeding and whether insurance would cover that if it is. Um, thank you. I'm also, I've also been made aware of that situation and I know some of our staff and attorneys have had some conversations about that, but I have to report back. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't have any information for you today, okay. but I'd be happy to check and, and, to, and to get back to you. Great. I think, again, it's, it's the type of thing where we don't necessarily anticipate this, um, but uh, it'd be useful to understand what, what we all think is the, the way things should be happening. Yep. And, and again, I think, I think as you mentioned, uh, clarification around coding or clarification as to what the proper uh, way to address COVID-related issues in our pra medical practices uh, would be welcomed. To, within your scope of authority. Right. I'm bringing us back to uh, our live screen. Um, I have reached out to Senator Lyons uh, without success, both by phone and text, et cetera. I think what I'm going to suggest is that um, I think we've covered the ground that we had hoped to cover. I don't see any additional questions. Are there any f questions that have developed in the interim or in the meantime? Uh, if not, I'd like to thank, um, oh, I see David Durfee, yes, I see you have a question, okay. Bill, I had lost my internet connection for a few minutes, so I'm not sure if we had already covered it or not, but there, there was more, we, 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 we were discussing when we broke, uh, we had finished discussing part one of the changes and. I just wasn't clear on whether two and three had already been reviewed. I'm not, Bill, and this is Jen. I'm not sure Jill is still with you, but if you are looking at um, the language looking for Jill. they had provided, two and three are are things you passed in Act 91. I was going to say they're, they're it's current. It's really just one that is amended. Yeah. Okay. I just want to confirm that. So does that make sense, David? Yeah, I had... I had a question about two that uh, Jill and I were discussing the email and I was just hoping to sort of tie up a loose end, but uh, I can I think we reach need to out do to her over email for that, yeah. I think we'll need to do that offline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So uh, it's my understanding that the Senate was intending to continue uh, at 10.15, that was our schedule at least, at 10.15, I'm gonna suggest that we bring this joint meeting to a close for House members. Um, and Nellie, I'm not sure how best you want to handle uh, proceeding with the senators and uh, hoping to reconnect with Senator Lyons in the meantime. Uh, let me just say two things quickly before the House, before we do conclude our joint meeting this morning. Uh, Senator Lyons and I have talked about ways to proceed and move this forward. We'll talk further and uh, we'll have some more discussion about that. Um, also, just a reminder that we are looking at tentatively a joint meeting again between our two committees next Thursday from 9 to 10. This is tentative because we haven't confirmed all the witnesses, but that's to look at an update on the CRF dollars from the healthcare provider um, initiative that this with CRF dollars that we put into place in June. Um, but we'll, but Demis and Nelly will confirm that with all committee members, but we, we, we at the House have added that, uh, Senator Lyons and I, again, thought it would be more efficient to do it jointly if possible. So I think with that, um, I think we'll conclude the House members being part of this for the morning. Uh, reminder, we're back on the floor at two, and Anne will be going to the House Appropriations on our behalf at, shortly. So uh, I don't see 
Um, Jill's still here, but I think it was this was a good idea and appreciate, again, their being proactive in this regard. So with that, Nelly, I think we're going to, I think we can go off live, live feed at this point for certain, and then I'll leave it to you and the senators to determine whether you leave your Zoom connection and restart again at 1015 once you've established a connection with Senator Lyons or how you want to best proceed. So maybe the senator should stay on and you for a minute and you. Yeah, I think I think House. house I think, I, off. Yeah, I think it might be easiest if the House members, if we just signed off and let the senators uh, determine how best they want to proceed. Okay. Hi everyone. Thank you.